There was a time long ago when the Matrix was hailed as the next Star Wars, and in that time, the universe was being expanded to match that hype. Comics, animated shorts, music albums, cell phones, and yes, video games. A no-brainer, really. The Matrix's choreographed fights and slow-motion shootouts seemed to lend themselves to video games perfectly. Yet, the franchise never found critical success in the interactive medium, and not for want of trying. The Matrix is one of my favorite movies, and the sequels aren't far behind. I love the series' style, the music, the outfits, the fights. These movies have everything you need for a good action film, paired with a thought-provoking, if heavy-handed, philosophical side, excellent world-building, and great performances. If anyone can find the good buried in the Matrix games, I can. So, what happened? What held the Matrix games back? What did they get right? And with the Matrix 4 on the horizon, where do we go from here? Before we get started, I want to get a couple of things out of the way. First, this is your spoiler warning. I'll be spoiling all three Matrix films, the Animatrix, and all three Matrix video games. If you've not seen the movies, I suggest watching all three and the anime. But at the very least, go watch the first film and reload it. Not only will the discussions of story beats make more sense, the atmosphere and aesthetic of these films are absolutely fantastic, and your first exposure really should be through the films, not a pair of PS2 games. Second, this is the longest video I've ever written by far. I've never taken on this ambitious of a project for a video before. Even though I'm covering multiple games, I've written more about each of the shiny games individually than any game I've ever reviewed. There will be timestamps in the description if you want to skip to a certain part. While writing The Matrix Reloaded and Revolutions, the Wachowskis made plans to expand the story of the films through other mediums. Reloaded premiered in May of 2003, and a month later, the Animatrix released straight to DVD. The Animatrix is a collection of nine short animated films intended to flesh out the world of the Matrix. Two portray the dawn of the human machine war, while another explains the origin of a minor character that appears in Reloaded. The first Matrix film drew heavily upon anime like Ghost in the Shell. And in a poetic realization of the Wachowski's wildest dreams, the Animatrix includes contributions from creators of legendary anime, such as Cowboy Bebop, Ninja Scroll, and Redline. The first short in the collection is called Final Flight of the Osiris. In the short, the crew of the Osiris finds out that the machines are building an army, and drilling down to attack Zion. The short follows the crew as they drop their warning into a mailbox in the Matrix, before they're all killed. This acts as a direct prequel to both The Matrix Reloaded and the film's tie-in video game, Enter the Matrix. Most movie tie-in games can be divided into two categories, standalone experiences set in the world of a film, and more traditional tie-ins that follow the events of the source material with varying degrees of creative liberty. Each is a valid methodology, with its own set of obstacles. The writers that work on standalone titles have to write stories that compare to the work of award-winning screenwriters. Not impossible, but the sort of team that typically works on this type of game isn't what you'd call a blockbuster. Writers with a finesse comparable to the Tarantinos of the world are not working on a Bourne tie-in. They're blazing their own trails with titles like The Last of Us. This isn't a knock against video game writers. Creating a narrative for the interactive medium presents an entirely different set of challenges from film. And with low budgets and tight timelines, film games don't have a fair chance to succeed. On the other hand, more direct tie-ins enjoy the luxury of leaning on their source material to do the narrative heavy lifting. But that luxury is a double-edged sword. While solving the problem of writing a quality story, it also creates a host of new problems. I'll get to those later, but suffice it to say that this type of project tends to be forgettable. Enter the Matrix is a unique game, because it doesn't fit into either of these categories. It isn't simply an interactive retelling of the film it's based on. It's a supplementary story that's inextricably woven into the film's plot. Reloaded relies on things that happen on Enter the Matrix, which itself relies on things that happen in both Reloaded and Final Flight of the Osiris. At the time of its release, Enter the Matrix was debatably the single most expensive video game ever made, with a development cost of $20 million. For reference, Grand Theft Auto Vice City cost $5 million in the same year. This number is often inflated further by including Atari Incorporated's $47 million acquisition of the studio that developed both Matrix games, resulting in a venture that was more expensive than the Matrix itself. The notion that a movie game had quadrupled the budget of the latest Rockstar open-world game in 2003 is kind of hilarious. 
but Atari's money was certainly spent in some unique ways. Enter the Matrix was written by the Wachowskis, who played a huge role in the development of the game, contributing ideas for level design to Shiny's team in addition to the story. The biggest contribution that the sisters brought to the table was nearly an hour of brand new footage, created exclusively for the game, with just as much quality and production value as the film itself. Thanks in no small part to the narrative of the game being intertwined with that of the film, sets and costumes were able to be reused, and in some instances, scenes as a whole are shown from a different perspective. For example, at the beginning of Reloaded, the crew of the Nebuchadnezzar relate to a meeting in the Matrix. In Enter the Matrix, we see Niobe, Ballard, and the other captains rowing through the sewers to get to the meeting point. No game has ever done anything like this, especially not with this sort of production value. I believe Enter the Matrix to be the single most ambitious movie game ever made. This might not sound like much of an achievement given that movie games are notoriously low-effort products, but hear me out. These real-world film clips are fantastic in quality. The cast all reprise their roles, and while Ghost can be a little dry, he has his moments. And Jada Pinkett Smith absolutely kills it as Niobe. Her scenes with Locke add so much to their characters that I'm not really sure why they weren't included in the film proper. Niobe, I have something to tell you. There's a strategy to counterattack the machines using the ship's EMPs. How many ships? All of them. Except yours. I convinced the Council that the Logos was too small, the EMP too weak to have an impact. That's not true. Maybe, but it's done. Jason, I am a captain, same as every captain. No, you're not the same. You're the woman I love. It's not right. I'm sorry, but I had to. I couldn't let you go, Niobe. I, I just couldn't. The truth is, the path of the one is made by the many. Are there two among you that would answer such a call? Each of us has our own steps to take, our own choices to make. Captain Niobe of the Logos will answer the Counselor's call. And if but one fails, all fail. This is actually something the game was criticized for, as people felt like some punches were pulled and reloaded in order to beef up Enter the Matrix's narrative. While I don't subscribe to the idea that the film was sabotaged, there are times where I question the extent to which these stories rely on each other. And given how commonly people complain of Locke's one-dimensionality, I doubt I'm alone in this. The live-action footage is used mostly for major story beats with the minutes and minutes stuff being handled through in-engine cutscenes. These leave something to be desired, graphically, but I don't think they're as bad as people make them out to be. Enter the Matrix is not a pretty game, make no mistake, but I personally feel like the cutscenes and character models look better than those in contemporaries such as Vice City. The live-action scenes were able to exist because these sets were already built, and the actors were already on them for the purpose of shooting Reloaded, while the missions in the game place the heroes in an airport, a nuclear power plant, and other locations that never appeared in the film. Most of the key storytelling is done in live action, and for the most part, the in-game cutscenes fill the blanks just fine. Though it should be stressed that unless you have seen Reloaded, nothing here is going to make sense. Enter the Matrix picks up right where Final Flight of the Osiris left off, with the crew of the Logos preparing to retrieve the Osiris' transmission from within the Matrix. Here we're introduced to our main characters. Sparks is the Logos' cynical operator, serving alongside First Mate Ghost and Captain Niobe. The player is allowed a choice between Ghost and Niobe, determining who they will play as for the duration of the game. Then they're set loose in a post office at closing time. The player fights their way through the office, retrieves the package of the transmission, and after a car chase and a close call with an agent, reaches an exit. Niobe reviews the transmission, warns Zion, and is ordered by Commander Locke to issue a recall order to all the ships that are up at broadcast depth. This prompts level 2, set in an airport where Niobe and Ghost use the banks of payphones to make cryptic calls to each ship's operator, bringing the plot in line with Reloaded's opening minutes. After the agents arrive, players control their selected character as they flee through the sewers, helping out the other red pills along the way as they fight their way through hordes of SWAT to locate their exit phones. Ghost and Niobe are cornered, but are pulled into the industrial hallway by the Keymaker. Our heroes enter a back door to the Merovingian's chateau, and are separated as they fight through the hallways full of werewolf goons. The player saves their partner, and escapes to the chateau's garage, where the twins chase them onto the freeway. This section once again intersects a scene from the film, as the player controls Niobe and Ghost in the minutes leading up to the semi-fight scene. At this point in the film, the Keymaker tells Neo what he has to do to meet the Architect, 
and the crew of the Logos set off to disrupt the city's power grid. In the film, we don't actually see this happen. Enter the Matrix accounts for this gap. The player fights their way through the power plant to get to the reactor core. Afterwards, Sparks receives a call from Seraph, who says he brings urgent word from the Oracle. You know where this is going. The player has to fight Seraph. If they win this fight, their selected character visits the Oracle. When playing as Ghost, he and the Oracle discuss a previous conversation about love, alluding to Ghost's romantic tension with Trinity. You must go. Thank you. Ghost. You still love her, don't you? As much as she loves another. That is a hard path to walk. Nietzsche said it best. One must want nothing to be different. Not forward, not backward, not in all eternity. Not only bear what is necessary, but to love it. Amour Pati. You're a good man, Ghost. If somehow we do survive, if the path does continue, I hope it is made by others like you. Like in Niobe's scene with Locke, this scene adds depth to Ghost's character. I wish we got more like this for Ghost, as he barely got screen time in the film, and I feel like he's a very interesting character. Near the end of filming for Reloaded and before filming for Revolutions, Gloria Foster, may she rest in peace, tragically passed away from diabetes. This led to Mary Alice taking over the role in both Enter the Matrix and Revolutions, and her change in appearance is actually turned into a plot point. Back in the industrial hallway, the player character is ambushed by several smiths, another parallel to Revolutions, and they fight their way through a skyscraper and Chinatown to get to an exit. Back on board the Logos, Sparks sees Sentinel activity on the radar, and the crew man their stations to participate in a tunnel run. Sparks activates the EMP, saving their lives but stranding them in the process. Ghost and Niobe share a moment of calm, and the credits roll. For what it's worth, I really like the story of Enter the Matrix. It adds a lot to the world and characters of the films. Ghost, Locke, and Sparks gain almost all of their backstory in this game, and the extra screen time devoted to Trinity and Niobe are very welcome. I'm glad I experienced it, and I'm glad it was made. I say this in hopes of softening the following blow. Enter the Matrix is not a good video game. While the Wachowski's storytelling efforts pay off, they write a check that Chinese gameplay simply cannot cash. The game's adaptation of Matrix staples such as bullet time, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and acrobatic stunts are novel, but they're marred by awful controls, stiff, repetitive animations, and a lack of depth so severe that it makes Watch Dogs look like a hacking simulator. In 1999, Bullet Time and Kung Fu were exciting rarities in Western cinema, but by the time The Matrix made its gaming debut, these ideas were no longer cutting edge. Beat-em-ups were plentiful in the sixth generation, especially in the realm of movie games, and Remedy had already written the book on Bullet Time two years earlier with Max Payne. Shiny aimed to capture the essence of The Matrix films by combining the slow-mo shootouts of Remedy's noir shooter with the martial arts of Hong Kong cinema. And while they succeed for the first 20 minutes, it falls apart rapidly after that. On first inspection, there's nothing glaringly wrong with the combat itself. The controls are... a mess, put simply. But provided you're able to get something resembling a grip on that mess, the basics of combat will come to you at the end of the introductory post office level. Players have four types of melee moves, punches, kicks, throws, and disarms. Each of these has a couple of animation variations, and a few more of her moves initiated during bullet time, where attacks carry more weight and might make use of walls for leverage. The player can also carry an infinite number of firearms, with a finite amount of ammo for each, and some can be held akimbo for more firepower and Hollywood flair. The post office level is intentionally easy, acting as a tutorial, since the actual tutorial was cut from the game late in development. The more serious problems become apparent in the airport level. The player is met with rooms full of heavily armed enemies, while acclimating to the introduction of sniping, more complex terrain, and platforming. If you could call wrestling with the controls platforming. By the end of this level, the player is likely going to realize a few things about Enter the Matrix's controls in combat. You cannot control the camera independently of your character. It's glued to their back, and the only way to look around is to physically turn Ghost or Niobe's body. This means you can't manually aim your guns, and so all ranged combat is handled through auto-aim. Hand-to-hand -hand combat becomes repetitive very quickly, as there are no combos, special attacks, or blocking mechanics. Having a simple combat loop isn't a death sentence, if the mechanics are strong enough to keep the player engaged and as long as the gameplay is kept fresh through other means. Unfortunately, neither of these criteria are met. There is only one type of enemy in each level, each and every one will behave exactly the same, with the only semblance of variety being the weapons that they use. They can all be killed either by gunfire or melee combat. Your choice. Since players will only fight one type of enemy, and can dispatch all enemies in a given level in the same manner, they will naturally gravitate to the most efficient way to do so, as nobody wants to use weak attacks. I'm not counting agents as enemies in this regard, because while they can technically be killed, you aren't meant to fight them outside of the rare boss fight. 
Agents are more like scripted events that happen to have AI in a player model. Because like a massive semi-truck or rapidly approaching fire pit, the player is meant to run from agents, not overcome them. In an ideal version of Enter the Matrix, this perfect technique would be a skilled combination of melee and ranged combat. But in practice, melee is all but unnecessary. The most common weapon in the game, the MP5, downs SWAT troops in just a few shots. As a result, hand-to-hand -hand combat feels like a bad decision in almost every situation, because pulling out a pair of MAC-10s would get the job done quicker and cleaner. The only time you'd actually want to use melee is to disarm an opponent. This is the only melee move that doesn't put you at a massive disadvantage, since enemies are kind enough to completely cease fire while you flip their friend and take his rifle. Even then, though, the best way to proceed is to rip the gun from their hands and then shoot them while they're on the ground. This may sound like the perfect balance of melee and gunplay I was talking about, but I don't think I could accuse this playstyle of being fun. Disarming still completely disrupts the breakneck pace the shooting playstyle enables, and the same danger can usually be averted by shoot dodging. I don't mean to make Into the Matrix sound like a competent shooter. It isn't. Gunplay does not fare much better than the melee, proving the superior option only because it gets the humdrum combat out of the way faster so the player can trigger the next cutscene. As previously mentioned, gunplay operates exclusively through woefully inaccurate auto-aim. You can't manually switch targets, you can't manually reload, and you can't shoot from cover without slowly stepping into the line of fire. You're able to enter a first-person aiming mode in the style of Metal Gear Solid, but you can't do this from cover and you'll be shot to pieces if you do this in normal combat. There's a sniper rifle that necessitates the use of this mechanic, usually from perches that are out of range of the people you're supposed to dispatch. But this first person aiming mode has no look acceleration, massive dead zones, and no aim assist. This isn't usually a problem, as enemies will stand still and look around for the source of sniper fire rather than fleeing to cover. But one particular section tasks you with defending a pair of red pills against waves of SWAT coming in from every direction. The AI stand out in the open and allow themselves to be killed, as the SWAT sprints towards them before I could dream of tracking them with this god-awful aiming system. Outside of this particular instance, the sniper sections are unchallenging and pass quickly. And while you can use the sniper rifle at any time, you'll never have occasion to. This game is begging for a free aim playstyle, which is probably why there are so many Matrix mods for the first two Max Payne games, among others. Even with ETM's Kung Fu systems, the Xbox and PS2 controllers are more than capable of providing this experience. I'm sure even the GameCube pad could manage. Instead, you're forced to deal with lock-on. Nearly every level in Enter the Matrix has the player fighting police and SWAT, meaning that the shoddy run-and-gun playstyle works for most of the game, but there is one exception where hand-to-hand -hand is the only option. In the Chateau level, the game sets up a new type of enemy, in the Merovingian's Vampire and Werewolf Exiles, who can only be killed by driving a wooden stake through their heart. As Ghost broke the leg off of a chair, I perked up at the idea that I'd be doing something besides punching my way through cops. Only to discover that these exiles are simply cops stripped of their weapons. You are forced to use hand-to-hand -hand combat, with guns being ineffective against exiles, but that's the extent of the differences. They put up a little fight and go down after a few good hits, at which point one of four or so finishing animations show your character stabbing the stake into the exile's chest. Vamps and Doberman do not fight differently from each other and there's only one model for each, meaning that the Chateau level devolves into room after room of beating up clones until the game triggers a hand death animation. You do find a crossbow that fires wooden stakes at the Merovingian's office, but you're only given two shots, no more ammo spawns anywhere in the level, and the characters even warn you to save them for something big. Logically, this led me to the assumption that the level was building up to a boss fight, so I carried the ammo all the way to the basement where, sure enough, I fought Cujo, the leader of the werewolf exiles. I pulled out my crossbow, expecting to make quick work of him, only to swiftly realize that he's invulnerable to projectiles and can only be defeated hand to hand. So of the two new forms of combat the game gives you to tackle these new enemies, one is just a repetitive animation tacked onto the end of normal melee combat, and the other is a gun that you can only fire twice that the game actively discourages you from using. What was the point here? Having an enemy type that is invulnerable to some kinds of damage is well and good, but when there's no reason to use melee attacks except when the game mandates it, this section just feels like padding. If the Exiles can only be killed by a wooden stake, why not have the player use a big one as a melee weapon? Levels in this game feel exceptionally empty, because other than in the post office, there are few or no neutral NPCs to give life to the environment. And given the game's budget, I don't see a reason for this to be the case. In their separate playthroughs, Ghost and Niobe play variations of the same levels, taking slightly different paths to the same end objective. This isn't always the case, the characters occasionally get their own set pieces, but most levels play similarly enough that it feels repetitive, 
This is a problem, because if you want to see the few different sections, like go shooting out the plane tire or watch all of the movie scenes, you'll have to play both campaigns. Even when things are switched up, you're usually just shooting your way through a different room, no different than if you picked the other character. During development, the two characters were supposed to represent different playstyles. Developers told official Xbox Magazine that Ghost was a gun expert, while Niobe was a strong martial artist. Best I can tell, this idea was canned, because the characters feel exactly the same. Playing the same level twice is a tough ask in any game. But when the levels drag on as long as the ones that enter the Matrix, it creates a real problem for replayability. Going through the post office, sewers, and chateau as both Ghost and Niobe would be fine if these levels didn't overstay their welcome. But these stages are artificially long and drawn out to a point that I considered not finishing my second playthrough. If you're approaching an exterior door or a hard line and enter the Matrix, and it's the first time you've done so in that level, you are maybe halfway done with that chapter of the story. The amount of fakeouts is frustrating, because the scenery and gameplay in each level will have gotten stale by the time the player arrives at them. Ghost backtracks through the post office like a Metal Gear Solid game, the sewers force you to fight through copy-pasted rooms while protecting idiot NPCs, and the chateau is just a button-matching time waste. Enemies will infinitely respawn, sometimes literally inches from the player's face. At one point during the sewer level, the game tells you that in order to progress through a dark hallway, you need to retrieve a flashlight hidden underneath the catwalks. Except, the flashlight is actually an MP5, a gun you already have. This triggers an ambush. The player fights through it and goes up through the now open exit, and never uses the flashlight that they picked up. If the player loses their duel against Seraph, they don't get a chance to retry. Seraph simply says, I am sorry, but the Oracle was mistaken. You cannot help us. and the player immediately proceeds to the ending tunnel run, skipping the meeting with the Oracle, the industrial hallway fight, and the skyscraper in Chinatown levels. In a game with this little level variation, there's no excuse for locking players out of several pieces of content for making a mistake, especially with combat this clunky and disconnected. On the rare occasion that an interesting new idea or mechanic is introduced, it's forgotten almost immediately. In the Chateau, the player rescues their injured partner from the Exiles and has to fight a pair of many bosses which can only be defeated by pushing them into jail cells. The game warns that they will only be held for a short time and gives you a button to put your partner down. So logically, this would happen a few times and take you through several cycles of combat. But no, you do it once. This game continually underutilizes fresh ideas, instead choosing to focus on the bland and repetitive ones. Speaking of bland and repetitive, this game has six car chases, and not a single one of them is fun. Half of these chases are played as Ghost. Aside from one overly long expedition through a man-made canal, Ghost spends these chases riding with Niobe, hanging out the window and firing a bottomless MP5. These sections are particularly miserable because Niobe's driving AI runs directly into the traffic, gets stuck on walls, and slows down for no discernible reason. No worries though, because you don't actually need to fight anybody as Ghost here. If you don't look at the enemies chasing you, they can't shoot you. I'm not kidding. In Niobe's version of the campaign, the player drives instead. Let me just say, I'm never going to complain about a game's driving physics ever again. The physics here are completely whacked out and in some levels you are told to aimlessly drive around and survive for a set number of minutes, another blatant example of padding for length. You're stuck in this awful first-person camera with no sense of your surroundings. Or so I thought. You can actually go into third person by pressing the black button, something that the game never bothers to tell you. I figured this out when I was almost done with my second playthrough, because I was so bored driving in a straight line that I started pressing random buttons to see if there was a boost or something I'd missed. This wasn't the only control or feature the game didn't bother to tell me about. Actually, Enter the Matrix habitually doesn't tell you shit. I thought it was strange that Ghost wasn't shooting out the window in these chases, only to realize by accident that I have to press Y to make him do so. The game doesn't tell you that if you press the disarm button while focused, you'll do a dodge move. When the player first encounters a sniper rifle, they're given a tooltip saying that in order to zoom in, they need to press the sniper rifle zoom in button. Which... isn't listed in the controls. Thanks, game. The animations were fully mo-capped, and in a vacuum, most of them look great, but their implementation leaves a lot to be desired. Niobe runs up invisible walls, clips through geometry, and breaks her arm when executing someone with their own pistol. And as for the tunnel run, Ghost mans a gun while Niobe flies the ship. Critics liken this section to the cult classic Descent. And while I see the resemblance, navigating the pipeline as Niobe is near impossible. The shooting section is awkward, boring, and it broke. The thing I was supposed to shoot got stuck. The last three minutes of my playthrough were spent doing literally nothing. 
The sound effect for this weapon is also absolutely terrible. Oh, and the game doesn't tell you that you can switch to the nose gun. Something else that the game leaves you to figure out on your own. Whenever I talk to anyone about Enter the Matrix, I get one of two responses. Oh god, that game is terrible! Or, dude, I love Enter the Matrix. Immediately followed by, have you played the hacking mode? At first, I thought the hacking mode was just a unique interface for inputting cheat codes. Which, it sort of is. The hacking mode is basically a hub for this game's bonus features, which are unlocked by either playing the main game or by completing the hacking puzzles. I use the term puzzles loosely because it's a pretty straightforward minigame. Use approximations of real DOS commands to log into a computer, gain access to new drives, find passwords, and make contact with Neo, Trinity, and later Sparks. Along the way, you discover cheat codes, character bios, and concept art, as well as the ability to replay cutscenes. Sparks tells you that you've inadvertently given the computer aboard the Logos a virus, and that you're the only one who can save it by running the ship's EMP remotely. He was just joking. Then he gives you a phone message from Neo himself and unlocks a gift. Go back and load your save game and sure enough, he's unlocked multiplayer. Something the game doesn't even advertise the existence of. It says it's one player on the back of the box. I played this game proper on Xbox, but since the world is currently ending, I loaded up a GameCube emulator and rounded up a friend to play this over Parsec. And you know what? We had a lot of fun. Granted, it's unfinished and bare bones, but it's a somewhat playable 3D fighting game. Each of the levels have a different set of characters to play as. Morpheus vs. Agent Smith, Niobe vs. Trinity, Sewing Woman vs. Janet- what? Interestingly, this plays and controls completely differently than the meat of the game. Not well, not even better, just differently. Put it this way, all of the issues are still present, but rather than playing a bad Max Payne, you're playing a bad Tekken. The camera randomly reorients itself so you're facing the wrong direction. The control layout is bizarre, and the movement is janky. The characters have distinct-ish movesets. They function basically the same, but each character has different animations. The game keeps score like a fighting game, and you play games that are the best of three, five... Does this, does this end? There's no character select screen, and each level has a preset character for player 1 and 2. As my friend and I made our way through the levels, we noted that it was strange that none of these levels let you play as Neo, figuring maybe it was being saved for last. With only one level left, we thought they had to be saving a Neo Smith showdown for last, right? Nothing could have prepared me for what we were loading into. A showdown for the ages. Firebird Man versus Police Car Man. They literally rearranged the body panels of the game's car models into walking, boxing robots that use Niobe and Trinity's fighting animations. In this video game of The Matrix, you do not play as Neo, but you play as a walking, Pontiac Firebird. They really were determined to do anything besides animate Neo in this game, weren't they? Wait, Firebird Man has angry eyebrows. Never mind, never mind, 10 out of 10, game's perfect. The multiplayer is a fun addition, but it's the type of fun that stems from a game being so bad it's good. The mode is obviously unfinished, buggy, and lacks features as basic as character select, which only amplifies my biggest question about this game. How is it that what was the most expensive game ever made feels like it was made on a shoestring budget? While I'm sure that a good portion of that 20 million went to producing live-action film segments, it should be noted that 20 million dollars is a third of the budget of the original Matrix film. And unlike that film, the sequences in this game contain almost no action, no special effects, took place on existing sets from Reloaded, and several of the shots were ripped straight from the films. So I don't know how they would have spent 20 million dollars making them. None of the failures here can be attributed to the ambitious storytelling. They fall squarely on unimaginative level design, asset reuse, and simplistic systems. Eric Lundborg produced an original soundtrack that was complemented by parts of Don Davis' film score and licensed music from the likes of Cell Dweller and Evanescence. The soundtrack is decent, but the game's dynamic music system is broken. At first, I thought this might have been my copy of the game, so I replaced it. But the issue persisted, so I thought it might have been my Xbox. Until I saw the other reviews mention the same issue, it persists on digital copies on the PC, and it even crops up again in Path of Neo. If you want to hear this music as Lundborg intended, you have to do so outside of gameplay. On the Xbox, the game runs at 720p or even 1080i at 60fps. But some levels are missing skyboxes and soundscapes, and enemies are spawned in midair on top of the player. The preview article in the official Xbox magazine painted a picture of a game with a proper tutorial, different playstyles per character, and additional real-world levels, none of which exist. The game is buggy, unpolished, and honestly, it feels unfinished, so what the hell happened? I can only speculate, but it seems that Shiny were in over their head. With the game scheduled to accompany the theatrical release of Reloaded, 
and Atari looking down the barrel of bankruptcy. There were so many factors working against the team that this was likely the best they could do. I severely doubt they played the game in-house and could say with a straight face that it was ready for release. Despite costing 14 times more to make than any other video game prior, Enter the Matrix not only failed to provide an innovative new take on action games, it failed to serve even as an acceptable one. Naturally, the sales reflected this. <laughs> Just kidding. It was the ninth best-selling game of 2003, the second most popular action game behind only Grand Theft Auto, and won a spot in the best sellers collection for all three consoles. Critical reception was bad, and players weren't thrilled with the game's lackluster action. But die-hard Matrix fans enjoyed the lore, world-building, and of course, the live-action film segments. To enter the Matrix is still the best way to experience this part of the story, and I don't regret my time with it. But I came away from the experience not only wishing it was better, but knowing that it easily could have been. In a decision I'm still struggling to understand, Shiny was contracted to make a second Matrix video game, subtitled Path of Neo. And from the very onset of the project, Shiny was fighting an uphill battle. Despite its flaws, Enter the Matrix was a well-intentioned and original attempt at tie-in storytelling, incorporating ideas that, on paper, paint it in a better light than Path of Neo. Almost no one from the original cast reprises their role for Path of Neo, with the only returning talent being Lawrence Fishburne. On Xbox, the second game lost widescreen support and ran at 480p at the absolute maximum, with a choppy frame rate and frequent slowdown. The Wachowski sisters returned to write, but Path of Neo was to be a retelling of the films rather than interactive addition to the lore. With the performance, narrative, and all-star cast out of the picture, Path of Neo seemed to abandon the few things its predecessor had going for it. And yet... Reload. They pulled it off. Shiny's second attempt at adapting the Matrix franchise managed to not only be an acceptable action game, but even a great one at times. Almost all of my complaints about Enter the Matrix have been resolved. Camera control isn't perfect, but it's manual this time around. Combat has been overhauled and is satisfyingly deep, and controls are explicitly shown to the player. Sometimes too explicitly. While I didn't mind playing as Niopi and Ghost, one of the wider criticisms of ETM at the time was that fans wanted to play as Neo, not side characters. Path of Neo finally makes that happen. The story may not be original this time around, but believe me, this is the farthest thing from a direct tie-in. I don't mean to shower Path of Neo with praise, as it does have its own fair share of issues. Mercifully, my complaints about the first game's pacing have been addressed, but there's a big asterisk affixed to that statement. Let's get my bitching out of the way, because it wouldn't be one of my retrospectives if it didn't spend a couple of minutes bitching about something. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you might remember that I teased something Matrix-related at the end of the Undercover PS2 video. At the time, I had planned to cover Path of Neo next, and nearly three months later, I put out something completely unrelated. The change in topic can mostly be blamed on Path of Neo's early hours completely occupied by the longest tutorial I have ever played outside of a JRPG. After a short reenactment at the beginning of the first film, and a small taste of the game's combat, Path of Neo launches into level after level of uninteresting, tedious instruction that, said and done, accounts for more than a quarter of the runtime. To be fair, there are relatively unique mechanics that need learning, but rather than teaching the player how to use these specific mechanics, Shiny instead chooses to treat you as if this was your first 3D action game. Look, this would have been an acceptable design decision in 2000, when both 3D action games and controllers with analog sticks were new to a significant portion of their audience. This also would have been an acceptable design decision if Path of Neo was a game of much grander scale, with more than a handful of unique controls and mechanics warranting more than a cursory explanation. Neither of these conditions are met, and the result immediately brings back memories of the shameless padding in Enter the Matrix, an awful first impression for a game that was already fighting for my attention after two full playthroughs of its predecessor. For once, I'm not exaggerating for comedic effect. The world record speedrun has only managed to optimize the tutorial down to 40 minutes. If you're tired of every shooter you've played for the last 15 years teaching you how to jump, crouch, and aim down sights for the trillionth time, you've experienced a sliver of the frustration that Path of Neo has to offer. To make matters worse, this tutorial only covers the most basic combos and special moves that Neo knows. As you unlock more, you'll be told how to use them once and then never again. There's no move list in the pause menu, which for a game that has context-sensitive combos and special attacks that can be executed at will is not a good decision. There are little prompts on the screen telling you when to press buttons to execute special moves, but they don't tell you what move you're executing, and further, they aren't always the best move for Neo to make. The fanciest of moves can be executed at will if an opponent is staggered, but the game doesn't prompt you to use them very often. You have to want and remember how to do them yourself. So not only is the tutorial stupidly long, it isn't particularly good at teaching you how to play the game either. When I originally started playing through Path of Neo last year, I bought a PS2 copy. After making my way through the tutorials, I decided I wasn't happy with how it looked or ran on the PS2. So I ordered an Xbox copy. 
don't do this. It doesn't run any better, and as I discovered after recording my playthrough for this video, the PS2 version actually supports widescreen, while the Xbox doesn't, making this one of those rare games that's worse on superior hardware. By the time I finished the second run through the tutorials, my patience had just about expired. This almost happened again while I was capturing the game for this review, because two-thirds through playing through the tutorial for the third time, I accidentally overwrote my save and had to start over. The issues with these levels aren't simply that they are tutorials. The frustration comes from the poor presentation and structure of almost all of them. Welcome to my world, Neo. How's the signal? It's a little loud. Is this better? Where am I? This, my friend, is a series of combat training simulations. And this is going to teach me Kung Fu. Works like a video game tutorial. You do still claim to be the ultimate gamer, right? Setting the tutorial outside of the events of the film was the right move. Your favorite fight scene won't be consumed by tooltips or dumbed down for the sake of the learning curve. But setting several hours of tutorials and generic approximations of dojos, Chinese restaurants, and caves full of ninjas is a perplexing decision that had me first confused, then sleepy. Yes, these themes are on brand for The Matrix, it's a love letter to Hong Kong cinema. But it's worth pointing out that this part of the film was just relatively small and didn't overstay its welcome. While Path of Neo makes a couple of self-aware jokes and proceeds to spend the duration of an entire Matrix film going full crouching tiger hidden dragon. This would be fine if the tutorial was about a third as long as it is, but almost every level devolves into overly long, multi-stage boss fights, or several waves of mini-bosses with ridiculous amounts of HP. Every time you think to yourself, this has to be it. I must finally be done, right? The next section of tutorials will begin. In a twist that's equal parts relieving and infuriating, the rest of the game doesn't play like this. Enemies are varied and die reasonably quickly, bosses and special enemy types are spaced appropriately, and levels end right before their stick starts to wear thin. The first three hours of Path of Neo do not represent the rest of the game at all, something that betrays Shiny's efforts in two ways. Not only does Path of Neo get exponentially better as soon as the player is actually inside the Matrix, players that are turned off by the tutorial grind won't make it far enough to realize that this is no simple movie tie-in. Prior to this most recent attempt to play through Path of Neo, I was a vehement defender of Enter the Matrix. Sure, it's janky, but at least it's original. There is merit in Enter the Matrix's concept, and on paper, I do still prefer an original story over a retread. But as far as retreads go, Path of Neo is a damn good one. And to think that if I hadn't pushed through hours of Kung Fu tutorial hell, I wouldn't have played what ended up cementing its place as one of my favorite video games. For Path of Neo, the Wachowskis took creative liberties not only to adapt the story to the gameplay, but to parody themselves. That is to say, this is a Wachowski-sponsored Matrix shitpost. This may be... Uh, a little dangerous. <laughs> How much more dangerous can it be? There's your answer, Neo. And I firmly believe that these awful, horrible, violent video games are offensive to our most basic values. What the hell are you boys doing? <laughs> Everything I am about to say is completely 100% true. I am going to list a few of my favorite moments from Path of Neo to give you the gist of what the hell is going on in this acid trip of a video game. Signs in the game world proclaim in Comic Sans that trench coats and sunglasses make you cool. In this game's rendition of the Tea House fight, Seraph and Neo fall through the roof into a movie theater. That's playing the Tea House fight scene from The Matrix Reloaded and Video Game Neo proceeds to fight Video Game Seraph in front of Movie Neo fighting Movie Seraph, while an audience member shouts at them and makes fun of the game's ham-fisted religious symbolism. No, no, hold on, hold on, wait, wait, I get it, I get it. The guy in the black jacket is the savior of mankind, and his fight with the other guy is some kind of test, right? 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 Nah, too far, fed. Neo and Morpheus are present for a United States Senate hearing where an approximation of John Kerry is giving a speech about violent video games. Mr. Kerry is interrupted when the room is stormed by dozens of Agent Smith clones. 
and of course, Neo proceeds to beat the shit out of Agent Smith with a flagpole on the Senate floor. In the basement of the Nerevengian's chateau, Neo is sucked into an MC Escher painting turned video game level, forcing the player to open a bunch of trick doors until they find the one that rotates the rolling gravity, going through several stages of exploration before finding an exit. Oh, and uh, Kung Fu ants. You fight humanoid ants that know Kung Fu. What the fuck were the Wachowskis smoking in 2005? Last, but certainly not least, the game ends with what seems like a fairly straightforward recreation of the Neo Smith fight from the end of Revolutions. You know, with all the clones watching on the side of the road, right? The one that ends with Neo fulfilling his Jesus prophecy and sacrificing himself to destroy Smith. Except, you know what, I'm just gonna show you this one. Hi, I'm Andy Wachowski. And I'm Larry Wachowski. Or rather, these are the digital projections of our mental selves. First of all, congrats on reaching the final stage of this game. You kick ass. Yes, we salute your excellence on the gaming field. Now, the real reason we're here is to discuss the big problem we faced in turning these three movies into a video game. You see, at this point in the story, Neo stands on the verge of Satori, ready to resolve the paradox of choice and choicelessness, of free will versus fate, but that can only be achieved through an act of surrender, which he occurs after he has abandoned the perspectival nature of truth, accepting the totality of present consciousness, which ultimately allows an evolutionary transition, transcending the Cartesian dilemma through the emergence of delimited spirit, which then provides the world with a choice of a third path, the path of Neo, the path of Pete. <laughs> you promised you wouldn't do that. Shit. Sorry. I think what my brother is trying to say is, at this point, it's martyr time. Now, maybe that works in a movie, but in a video game, the Jesus thing is, well... Lame. Really lame. If you're like us, then right now you're ready for 15 minutes of sweaty, palmed, button-pushing action to kick the crap out of some big, badass boss. So we suggested to the Chinese that we change the ending. We thought it would be cool after Smith rose up screaming, It's my world! The other Smiths jumped onto emerging into one massive monster, monster mega Smith. So if you're ready, it's time for a little Hulk versus Galactus action. Good luck. You'll need it. And enjoy enlightenment. <laughs> 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 then all of the Smith clones fly up in the air and morph into a giant Mega Smith kaiju, with pieces of parking garages and cars making up his skin. And then when the skyscraper-sized Smith reaches over to a billboard, advertising the exact make and model of his sunglasses, and takes the massive pair off the billboard and puts them on. Because of fucking course he does. And then, Mega Smith yeets pieces of buildings and handfuls of normal-sized Agent Smiths at you until you fly into his head and destroy him as We Are the Champions by Queen starts playing over a montage of a celebration in Zion before the credits roll. No, not even that part was a joke. If Enter the Matrix is multiplayer is what you get when the developers spend the last of their budget on a weekend-long Coke binge, the whole of Path of Neo is what you get when your newest game sells 5 million copies and you buy enough Coke to last an entire development cycle. For all their Jesus metaphors and edgy costumes, the Matrix films cannot be accused of lacking self-awareness. They dubbed in a bowling sound effect of Burly Brawl, for Christ's sake. Going into this, I knew that Path of Neo had some ironic humor and self-parody, but I had no idea what level of batshit insane self-own I was walking into. I'll admit that I'm not a fan of the implication of the decision to change the ending. The idea that it would be lame or otherwise not viable for a game to have a meaningful or profound ending betrays the respect for the medium the sisters channeled two years earlier, in creating an entire game of unique canon. But the end result is so hilarious that I really don't care. To clarify my statement about the way the story was retold, there's more to the game's difference on approach than goofs and gags. In typical movie game fashion, iconic scenes that last just a couple of minutes on screen are stretched out to the length of a full level, usually by taking pretty big liberties with continuity. The first post tutorial level takes place in the Lafayette Hotel, and the escape sequence following Neo's first visit with the Oracle. In the film, everyone gets to the wet wall, Morpheus is captured, and then everyone else escapes to the basement. In the game, Neo is walled off from the rest of the team before they can reach the wet wall and the level sees the player wandering through a maze of apartments, bathrooms, and hallways that is continually being restricted further as the agents add new walls. The player encounters cops and SWAT, who seem very confused about the sudden appearance of new walls, but they brush that out of their mind as soon as they see Neo, giving the game an excuse to have you fight through rooms of SWAT. 
the chapters usually start and end in the same place as the film, with gaps being filled in with supercuts of dialogue and action from scenes that aren't part of the game. These cutscenes are extremely brief, and tend to break sequence pretty often, meaning this is not a viable way to experience the story for the first time. But come on, that's not who this game is for. Path of Neo assumes you know the Matrix story well, and focuses 95% of its energy on gamifying the saga in a way that puts gameplay and fun first. If you've never seen the Matrix films, Path of Neo's story isn't going to make sense. You might get the gist of it, but you aren't going to understand anything from Reloaded onwards at all. In fact, the final showdown with Megasmith is literally the only part of Revolutions that made it into the game at all. And no, I'm not going to make the joke. But where Enter the Matrix tells a story that is meant to be a serious addition to the universe, Path of Neo does not demand that you take it seriously. And more importantly, it's actually a fun video game in its own right. Once again, the experience is a mixture of beat-em-up martial arts and lock-on shooting combat. This time around, though, there's depth behind the pretty animations. Not a lot of depth, mind you, but now there's a combat system rather than a combat button. Gunplay is similar to that of Enter the Matrix, but this time it's actually functional. There's a large targeting reticle removing any ambiguity about who or what you're aiming at, and the lock-on targets can be cycled through with the right stick, allowing for prioritization of targets. Additionally, players will find that Neo is actually quite proficient with firearms this time around. As a result of these two changes, players will find themselves able to drop enemies efficiently at longer ranges than before. At first, this raises concerns that Path of Neo is about to repeat the mistakes of its predecessor, where guns were the least broken option and thus the only one you were likely to use. Thankfully, Path of Neo scales back the amount of ammo you can carry, drops less in the environment, and introduces more than one type of enemy. Riot cops must be flanked, or separated from the bulletproof shield, before they can be dispatched with guns, while agents and certain other bosses are once again good at dodging bullets and this is communicated properly this time around. This newfound balance is aided by a revamped melee system. Path of Neo adds combo attacks, grabs and grapples, dodges and counters, special moves, and melee weapons. The punch and kick buttons from Enter the Matrix have been consolidated to one button, mapped by default to Y or Triangle. The freed B or Circle button goes for a grab, while X is now purely for dodging, whether focus is active or not. Path of Neo does still play like a typical 6th generation action game. You move through rooms, kill a bunch of baddies, and proceed to the next. Like Enter the Matrix, there's nothing inherently unique about the gameplay mechanics. The fun in Path of Neo's combat is derived from the player's desire to see Neo do cool shit, and to participate in the events of the films. Neo starts out with a relatively small moveset and with a very small focus meter, but as the game moves along, he learns new moves and combos through the unlock tree, called the Path of Neo. I call it a tree, but it's really a few tiers of rings. The earliest tiers have pretty basic moves, multi-hit combos, grab attacks, and focus maneuvers. The third tier has more powerful moves and finishers, and the fourth tier is reserved for something the game calls Atman Principles, which I'll get to in a second, because they don't really work like the rest of the rings. There's a second reason that calling the path an unlock tree is misleading. There are very few times that an unlock will present a player with a choice. Most of the time that I leveled up and gained an unlock token, there would only be one option for me to unlock. You can't move on without spending the token, and leveling is not something done by gaining experience, but at fixed points in the game where a set piece or boss fight demands a new ability become available. I find this system kind of puzzling because it has the skeleton of something intended to be much larger and open-ended. Why does this game give you one unlock point at a time if everything costs one point, only one or two options are available at any given time, and points can't be banked? There is still that fourth ring I mentioned, the Atman Principles. These show up with encoded titles and descriptions that contain poetic riddles. When purchased, they gain a name and reveal their purpose. These are temporary modifiers that become available for selection gradually, but unlike combat moves, these are consumable. Unlocking a principle means it will be activated for the next mission, or in some cases, added to Neo's inventory to be activated when the player needs it. Some are useful, like the one that gives Neo extra health and focus for the duration of a level, or another that allows Neo to resurrect when his health bar is drained, rather than restarting from a checkpoint. Others are less useful, like the one that allows Neo to heal friendly characters three times. I like the idea of consumable buffs that allow players to make a level easier or just more fun, at the expense of some sort of earned currency, but the Atman principles are just about useless. So much so that I question their inclusion. It might sound useful to have a second life bar or extra focus, but the issue here is that the player is forced to select the principle they want to buy at the end of a level, before they even know what they'll be up against in the next. I bought the principle that gives you a second life bar before playing a level that I breezed through with zero difficulty. Imagine spending your upgrade point on the heal follower principle, only for the subsequent level to not have any followers to use it on. Further, forcing players to take a blind plunge into a principle to learn what it does is bad design. You only gain the ability to purchase the principles in later stages of the game, and in a game this short, it's not fair to make the player risk wasting their token on something they might not be able to use. After being consumed, these principles can be purchased again, but their names and descriptions disappear, meaning you'll need to remember which is which in the future. I shouldn't need to guess the meaning of a fucking fortune cookie to know if what I'm spending a skill point on is the gift of resurrection, or... Spoon. It's... just called Spoon. Press the button to see a demonstration. 
It's just Neo holding a spoon. I assumed that unlocking this would have some late game ramifications since this is the only principle that remains unlocked for longer than one level, but no, it's just a spoon. After beating the game and looking it up, I found out it unlocks a level called Zion Archives, which is the deck of a hovercraft with a few unused and bizarre character models on it. No combat, no explanation, no developer commentary. Just a few unused models standing on some platforms. I can't help but feel that the system was meant to be more. The existence of the path doesn't serve any gameplay purpose that isn't fulfilled elsewhere. Some of these moves are taught to the player with the game-pausing tooltip during the level, and there's no reason this wouldn't have worked for the ones in the menus. As for the principles, they're basically useless. But they didn't need to be. Allowing the player to unlock them on the fly from a pause menu would have been the smarter play. This would have allowed players to make informed decisions, rather than risking purchasing a principle that doesn't help with the level they're playing. This would also allow for principles to be introduced at moments when they become viable or useful for the player. If principles are introduced slowly enough, even the fortune cookie shtick could be retained, as there would be fewer new options competing for the player's attention. But it needs to be permanently named after the first time they buy it. Technically, Path of Neo is a mixed bag. The frame rate chugs, the resolution and aspect ratio are a step backwards, and the models and facial animation are... This is my world, Mr. Anderson! My world! Really questionable. But to its credit, it does look much better than Enter the Matrix in terms of effects and environments. Rooms are filled out much more often, reflections shine off of lobby floors, and combat animations are fluid. There's a PC version, but my only exposure to it is in a Dunkey video, where he encounters a lot of bugs that I saw no signs of during my playthrough. You'll never make it. I might. I might make it if you continue to shoot this man. This is not one of the three working techniques. I'd say that either console version is acceptable, just don't expect the most fluid frame rate on the planet. Having already discussed the game's mechanics and its standout moments, I'd like to spend some time on how Shiny and the Wachowskis translated the film into the interactive medium when they weren't indulging in their ridiculous self-deprecation. Some ideas are explored just enough to flesh out the experience, and others are abandoned too quickly. One of the core themes of The Matrix is choice. Early on, Path of Nia would seem to embrace this theme, while resolving issues choice created in the earlier game. Enter the Matrix tells a fixed, canon story that always ends the same way but there are still small elements of choice woven in. Whether you choose to play as Ghost or Niobe has an effect on your experience, as does the outcome of your fights with Trinity or Seraph. That second bit is less choice and more consequence, and I'm not the biggest fan of the consequence of losing the latter fight, causing you to miss a chunk of the game. But the idea of failure having a tangible consequence is an interesting one, and at first, Path of Neo seems to make an acceptable trade-off. From the get-go, players are presented with the same choice that Neo makes in the first film. Which pill do you take? Obviously the game needs to happen, but this sets an expectation that Path of Neo is going to let you see other ways the events of the film might have played out. An expectation that is embraced, but only briefly. When reenacting the office scene, the player can successfully escape and ride away with Trinity as originally planned. The point where Neo chickens out in the movie is just a start of a level where Neo jumps across gaps, shimmies along ledges, and shoves his way through hallways and stairwells to reach the ground floor. But after a certain checkpoint, getting captured isn't a fail state. After all, it happens in the film. If the police manage to apprehend Neo, the player can choose to try again, or accept capture. Choose the latter option and things will play out like in the film. Manage to escape successfully, and Trinity takes Neo directly to Morpheus in the hotel. Unlike the Seraph fight in ETM, this works because there is no outcome where the player is locked out of content. If I want to retry and play the rest of the level, I can do that. Making a mistake won't mean I get to play less game than someone who didn't. What's puzzling about this level though is that it's the only level in the game like this. There's no other section that allows the player to accept the consequence of defeat and see the story play out differently, not even the Seraph fight. There's an argument to be made that this is because things needed to happen the way they did in the films. But if that's the case, why is the office escape any different? Besides, I think some of the other liberties this game takes with the canon dismiss this justification outright. Closest the rest of the game comes to enforcing consequences for failure is in the first of the proper tutorial levels, where Tank challenges Neo to stealth kill a couple of guards without triggering an alarm. Success means Neo gets a wooden staff for the tournament section later in the level. While well, failure means he doesn't. I was sure stuff like this would happen later, but that's it. Once the tutorial is over, the player will fight through mostly straightforward renditions of the wet wall escape, the lobby shootout, the government rooftop fight, the helicopter gun section, and the subway duel with Smith. As you'd expect, these levels are all extended to make for a reasonable amount of gameplay. Moving through the sewer after the wet wall escape sees a walled off Neo fight an agent one on one until the team can rescue him. The rooftop fight features waves of SWAT fast wrapping onto the roof and it was an extended fight during Neo's escape from the subway leading to the first film's conclusion, which is of course, a boss fight. This is all very straightforward and very fun, and I'm glad, because after three hours of I know Kung Fu, I was very much ready for some normal Matrix fare. There's a deviation, though, between phases of the subway escape. 
Neo falls through a compromised floor and ends up in a corrupted subway platform. The glitchy conductor program demands a token, and after acquiring one, Neo boards the train and asks to use the phone. There's all kinds of trippy shit going on in this section. It's somewhat of a precursor to what comes in the Ezra section later on, with train cars rotating and losing their gravity. After it's over, Neo moves on through the subway into the ending of the first film, as if it didn't happen. This section feels disjointed, because while it's strange, it's not nearly as hysterical as the game's other quirks, and nothing of consequence happens in this sequence. This is one of the few moments in Path of Neo that feels like padding for the sake of padding, rather than for the sake of extending scenes for gameplay purposes. It comes immediately after one of the best boss fights in both the games and the movies, and proceeds to narrative conclusion in a way that completely breaks the pacing. I personally would have cut it, but I can't fault Shiny too much for this. I'm sure figuring out how to stretch 6 hours of film into 10 hours of pure combat gameplay is not an easy task, especially given the high percentage of these films that's occupied by talking, world building, and sexy cavern raves. That said, the 5 or so minutes spent trying to figure out where the hell gravity went between stretches of beating the shit out of Agent Smith don't quite add to the experience. One way that the game achieves its runtime is by bridging the gap between the first and second film, with a set of short, original levels where Neo frees people from the Matrix. And of course, all of these levels entail a healthy dose of combat, because when does anything go right in this universe? These levels are presented to the player on a map, with a simple clue as to who the person in each area is. The player can choose to do these in any order they like, but they must complete all of them to move on. One character runs an herb shop called Red Pill. Another is a girl at a party who comes into possession of a programmer key. A librarian is driven crazy by a book that seems to replicate itself, while police prepare to raid the house of an artist who has powers he can't explain. If you were a fan of the world building and Enter the Matrix, this section will be up your alley. I enjoy this little window into what's going on in the Matrix outside of the overarching machine war plot. These levels are short, simple, and interesting, and they don't intersect the narrative in an awkward way. The level select format continues into the start of the reloaded levels, as Neo helps various major and minor characters escape from the sewer meeting. This part is once again padding for the sake of padding. Maybe it's because I spent such an unreasonable amount of time helping the same dumbass characters escape in the last game, but I wanted these levels over with ASAP. Thankfully, the game rapidly settles back into its linear path through the events of the films after these levels. The Burly Brawl deserves a mention just because of how fun it is. It looks a little goofy with the filler non-interactive smiths in the background, but I couldn't pull myself away from doing cool spin attacks long enough to care. This fight is long and dense enough to allow all the special combos and melee weapons to shine bright, and serves as the moment when I really fell in love with Path of Neo's combat. The Chateau level is punctuated with a series of three dungeons, one focused on melee with the boss fight, one focused on gunplay with the boss fight, and the aforementioned Escher level with the ants. Padding, yes, but not offensive padding. The combat-focused chambers are among the most challenging in the game, and both do a good job of restricting your options to force you to change up your playstyle. The Escher level puts you against the Insect Exiles, which are very hard to dispatch unless you use fire. Neo can swing torches at them, or throw them into fire pits. The combat drags on a little long and distracts you from trying to explore and find an exit. You have to figure out which door will take you where you want to go, and which is going to spit you out somewhere useless and disorient you further. Platforming and pathfinding this level is bewildering, and I feel this was intentional. In a way, it plays into the pure what-the-fuck factor of a Matrix video game making you kill kung fu insects in an Asherian fever dream. Lastly, the final boss. This is the only content in the game from Revolutions. But it's decently long, and of course, is the ultimate final showdown for the franchise, and I have to say, they really sell it as a battle for all the marbles, simply because the fight takes its time. It's long, it's not done as fast as you can button mash your way through it like a lot of other games. It starts out as pretty standard combat, with Smith occasionally rocketing the two of you up into a random building. You go a round of combat up there, and then he lowers you back to the street. Whenever either of you gets too close to the Wall of Clones, they'll shove Smith or Neo back into the ring. This was a little too sensitive and would trigger if I got anywhere near the edge of the street, but hey, it's cool that the clones are interactive at all. He says the line, the Wachowskis interrupt, and then we go to the second phase. At this point, you're hovering in the air rather than walking around, and you can really only move in a large ring around the Megasmith. You're supposed to use buildings as cover and dodge Smith's attacks until he throws his arms in the air and roars, at which point you're safe to charge him and blast part of his parking structure body off. He throws handfuls of screaming Smith clones that'll latch onto you, prompting a short quick time event, but that's really all there is to this boss phase. If you happen to mess up one of your charges, Smith will knock you low to the ground and you'll have to do finishing blows on chunks of building to avoid taking damage long enough to get another chance to charge at him. This fight is accompanied by the only good CGI cutscene in the game done by Blur Studios, whose name you might recognize as the VFX studio that worked on all kinds of games like Sonic 06, Halo Wars, Halo 2 Anniversary, and the new Modern Warfare. Seeing this high-quality cutscene makes me wish they had done the same for the rest of the major missions because, man, these other ones are terrible, but I'm sure it wasn't exactly cheap. After all, this game was not working with as big of a budget as Enter the Matrix. Once Smith is defeated, he and all of his clones explode, and the kid declares your victory to Zion. Cue the Queen song. 
I was really pleasantly surprised by Path of Neo. Like, really surprised. I said earlier that this has become one of my favorite games, and while that's primarily because I love The Matrix, I genuinely think this is a worthwhile beat-em-up. It uses its source material as a style guide, and as an excuse to let you do all kinds of badass shit in slow motion. As far as 6th gen movie tie-ins go, that's an outcome I can live with. I wish it was a little more polished, I wish it ran a little better, and I wish that the tutorials weren't so long. But Shiny far exceeded my expectations. If you only play one Matrix game, this should be it. And play the PS2 version. It'll look better than on the Xbox, and be less buggy than on the PC. It's not the cheapest PS2 game around, but it's certainly not expensive. And I've always felt like the PS2 controller has lent itself better to this type of game anyway. Critically, the game didn't do great. It reviewed better than Enter the Matrix, but it was still pretty middle of the road. And you know what? That's fair. This game has a lot of issues. But like any good movie tie-in, Path of Neo offers something that none of its beat-em-up competitors can. An expansion on something you already love. Nothing can quite replicate the world of these films. Nothing can satisfy your hunger for a Matrix game, except for a Matrix game. For all its improvements, Path of Neo still doesn't escape Shiny's shortcomings. But at its high points, it does make me forget about them. A decade before Shadow of Mordor, and concurrently with the well-remembered Fear, Monolith Productions had their own hand in the expansion of the Matrix universe, when they released The Matrix Online in early 2005. MXO was to be an evolving stage, where the Matrix storyline would be pushed forward. The game was one of many emerging titles in the post-World of Warcraft explosion of MMOs, and it wasn't particularly well received. But much like Enter the Matrix, the Wachowskis had some ambitious ideas for what a Matrix MMO could be. In light of his work on the Matrix comics, the Wachowskis entrusted Paul Chadwick with writing the future of the Matrix canon, under the oversight of producer Joel Silver, who had produced all three films. These weren't minor storylines either. Just one week of MXO's story depicted Morpheus's attempts to recover Neo's body from the machines, becoming a terroristic bomber when they wouldn't cooperate. And what did the machines do in response? They killed Morpheus! That's right, Morpheus, Lawrence Fishburne's iconic character from the films, canonically becomes a terrorist and then is gunned down in the street by an assassin. There was some serious stuff going on here. Real people played the parts of major characters from the film and have real-time conversations with players, hosted live events, and allowed players to have a tangible effect on the course of the story, while also providing direct anecdotes of player sentiment and experience to the team. MXO has been offline for over a decade, and while emulation is in early stages, all you can currently do is walk around empty streets. You can also create a character and fly around, and there are even some NPCs now, but the world is still more or less non-interactive. Everything I'm going to tell you in this section is secondhand knowledge, sourced from old YouTube videos, reviews, articles, and the Real World Matrix Online magazine, which I happen to own an issue of. I'm not going to go as in-depth with this one as I haven't experienced it for myself, but it's a very interesting story that deserves to be told. Like other MMOs, the Matrix Online had a class system of pretty typical archetypes. Hackers, coders, and operatives were similar to casters, summoners, and fighters in other MMOs. Hackers specialized in ranged abilities known as hacks that either debuff and damage enemies or buff and heal allies. Coders create creatures known as simulacrum that fight for them, while operatives use guns, knives, and their martial arts prowess to fight directly. This class system was fluid. Players could hot swap between playstyles by visiting a phone booth. MXO's combat was a bit complex, implementing a custom system known as interlock that worked in tandem with free fire combat. The game boasted that it avoided typical MMO turn-based combat in favor of more fluid interaction. This allowed for large-scale conflicts where sheer numbers often determined the victor. Players pledged allegiance to one of three factions when creating their character. All characters were red pills, but they could fight for Zion, aim for coexistence through cooperating with the machines, or act in their own selfish interests under the Merovingian. Sub-factions emerged, such as the EPN, a group that devoutly followed the path of Neo. There were also the Cypherites, a group of players who took after the organization's titular character, wishing to be plugged back into the Matrix, and working for the machines in hopes of achieving that goal. The Matrix Online was ambitious and blazed new trails in MMO storytelling, but it faced difficulties from the very start. The game struggled with subscription numbers, barely breaking 50k concurrent players at any given point. Not three months after release, Sega sold the game off to Sony Online. The game shut down in 2009, with the final moments seemingly being portrayed as a system crash, where everyone inside the Matrix dies. Fans have compiled the complete storyline of the game into an ebook, as well as preserved some of the machinima and fan made films within its sandbox. There's also a very detailed episode of Death of a Game about MXO. All of this will be linked in the description, so if you're interested in learning more about this relic of the MMO age, be sure to check these out. Fifteen years have passed, and there will be a new Matrix film in theaters soon. I'm cautiously excited, but I want someone to take another crack at a Matrix video game more than I want a new film. The three efforts thus far have all been interesting in their own ways, but none of them provided definitive experience. 
Enter the Matrix has a good narrative but bad gameplay. Path of Neo has a good gameplay but no narrative to call its own. And Matrix Online has been gone for a decade and will likely never be playable again. It's fair to say that video games are in a much different place than they were 15 or even 10 years ago. Even back then, games were capable of telling incredible stories and setting the player loose to explore a world full of life, detail, and lore. But studios have only gotten better and better at this as years have passed. The original three games are from the adolescence of 3D graphics. Now that the medium has more or less figured out how games should look and control, the ideas that didn't work out in Enter the Matrix and Path of Neo might just click. Now more than ever, a Matrix video game could contribute something remarkable, both in terms of the film's universe and the game's medium as a whole. Given how much time I've recently spent playing the previous Matrix games and learning all I can about this universe, I thought it might be fun to explore how a new game in this universe could work. Initially, I had written a much more extensive take on this concept. But as someone who doesn't make video games, it would be hard to discuss the creation of a new game and its mechanics without referring to existing titles. I don't want this to be a derivative game that applies a Matrix paint job over the same tired formulas we already see several times a year. With that said, I don't think learning from the success of innovative games is a bad thing. Almost every mechanic in modern games can be traced through a lineage of other successes over the years. As I wrote out this long wishlist for features and mechanics, I realized I was being an armchair developer, and that whatever team would take on this project would be much more qualified to make these decisions than me. Still though, I do have some ideas that I think are worth sharing. Let's start with story. Obviously, I don't know what Matrix 4 had any potential follow-ups have in store for the universe or its characters. Trinity and Neo are back somehow, so... We have legitimately no idea how that works or where this new film is headed. As much as I enjoyed the interconnected story concept from Enter the Matrix, I don't think the Wachowski should take a new game that route. Primarily because games have proven that they're capable of so much more than playing second fiddle to a film or book. Transmedia storytelling through games has been attempted time and time again, but the best adaptations and tie-ins have mostly been standalone experiences. Developers must be given creative freedom to make something that plays to the strengths of video games before worrying about tying into whatever other project they're supposed to be supporting. A game needs to be fun to play in its own right more than it needs to be canon. With that in mind, why not set the new game in a previous version of The Matrix? When Neo visits the Architect, it's revealed that there were five ones before him. Since they're mentioned so briefly, little is known about them. According to the Architect, every previous one shows the future of humanity over rebellion. If the Architect was telling the truth, Neo is the first one to pick the other door, to persist with the rebellion and fight to save everyone in Zion, not to rebuild it from the ground up. Even then, though, it's entirely possible that the Architect was lying. Either way, telling the story of a previous one would solve a lot of problems the movie tie-in game presents. No details about previous cycles are known, except that the one is born inside the Matrix and that ultimately the system is rebooted and Zion starts from square one. This gives the writers an incredible amount of creative freedom with the story. I say the writers, because I don't want this to just be a Wachowski joint. A game of this scale is going to need someone who primarily writes games at the helm, because as previously discussed, writing for interactivity is a whole different ballgame from film writing. Lana Wachowski should be involved with the writing, but she needs someone with experience creating game narratives to keep her in check. Since the film center around the concept of choice, it's only fitting that a new Matrix game implement choice where possible. I'm not saying I want a role-playing game, though now that I think about it, a single-player Matrix RPG actually sounds pretty sweet. Maybe an action RPG in the vein of the new Assassin's Creed games could work. That seems to be the route that a lot of games have been taking in recent years. Even games that couldn't be classified as RPGs all have features that, 15 years ago, wouldn't have been found outside of that genre. This game needs to be action-adventure first, but there's room in that formula for branching story paths and role-playing. Let the player create their character, pick a background, and select a hacker name from a short list that allows voice actors to still call them by their chosen name. Maybe adopt the class system from The Matrix Online in a way that better lends itself to the real-time third-person shooting and martial arts combat. And most importantly, have side content for the player to explore and learn about The Matrix world that is canon. This is why I want Lana to be present, because ultimately this game should be canon. Maybe not all endings, maybe not all character relationships, but the beauty of setting the game in a past timeline, where every single person inside the Matrix is wiped out, is that nothing that happens in this iteration of the system will ever need to be acknowledged in the future. Each and every player can come away having both experienced carefully thought out lore, and having experienced a story that is their own. Unless it becomes a plot point in future Matrix films, I don't see any way that Lana would be forced to address a fifth iteration of the system, much less in a way that would invalidate a player-determined character. So, in my mind, this is the perfect setup. I'm not sure that I want to speculate more than this on the future of the franchise's interactive endeavors. Designing a game is easier said than done, so I'll leave it up to the machinations of whoever takes the helm. I really enjoyed looking back on the Matrix franchise for this video. In preparation, I watched the Animatrix for the first time, rewatched the film trilogy twice, and of course, played the two games that you still can. For all of the flaws in these games and the films they accompanied, I'm still coming away from this experience hungry for more. Personally, that's pretty significant, as normally when I make a video about something, even something I love, I'm pretty tired of thinking about it by the time I'm finished writing and editing. 
It speaks to how special and unique the Matrix is that even after ripping Enter the Matrix a new one for half an hour, I'd gladly put it right back up and do it all again. If you asked my thoughts on the sequels prior to starting this video, I'd tell you that I liked Reloaded but probably wouldn't see Revolutions again. And now I've come to appreciate it. Except those fight scenes in Zion. Those still suck, but the point is, these games were still valuable pieces of this franchise. Path of Neo is a good time and a great laugh. Enter the Matrix is an extended cut of Reloaded that you can play. And going forward, I can only hope there's more gas in the tank for this series. That we get more chances to experience this world for ourselves. And if they manage to make a better game at the same time, well, that'll just be a bonus. Thank you for watching, and a very special thanks to my lovely patrons. Adam Wozniewski, Andre, Andrew Elmore, Ben M, Christopher James, Gary Pay, Jesse Scales, Kai M, Caitlin Bowers, Winning Me, Mr. W, Rachel, Ravage the Jaguar, and Ryan. If you like what I do, Patreon is a great way to help me out and support the channel. Just a couple of dollars a month does make a huge difference. Either way, your viewership is appreciated, and I'll see you next time.